Good afternoon, and welcome to our session on power shift to the East, China, and the relationship with the West. My name is Renyani Lingren, and I am a senior research fellow at NUPI, and I will be moderating this session, which engages with some of the most debated themes of our time today, namely the role of China in international order, how power is shifting to the East, and what this means for the West. In our session, we will touch on some of the key domestic drivers of Chinese foreign policy, as well as China's goals and ambitions in the domains of security, economy, and global influence. And to do so, we have with us some of Norway and Europe's leading experts. We will begin with a speech by Professor Rana Mittid of Oxford University, where he will provide the context of China's growing power and the increasing tension between China and the U.S., but also various European powers' positions. We will then have a follow-up conversation with good colleagues Ewing Gebekefold of the Institute of Defense Studies and Alaria Karotza of PRIO, uh, and we will have an exchange of views towards the end of the session. I would like to remind you that you, as the audience members, have the ability to ask questions throughout this session through the uh, QR code on your invitation, so we'd like to engage with those as well. But let's get started. Our first speaker, Rana Mittid, is a professor of history and politics of modern China at Oxford University. He is the author of several books, including Forgotten Ally, China's War uh, No. 2 in 2013, which was actually the book of the year in the Financial Times and The Economist. And he is a committed regular on China and media platforms around the world, including the World Economic Forum in Davos. And Rana will be transitioning this year to a role at Harvard University's Kennedy School as the STEM chair, the ST Lee chair on U.S.-China relations. So with that, Rana, I would like to welcome you to the stage. Thank you very much indeed, Ren, and thank you for Nupi and everyone else who has brought together a fantastic gathering here uh, today. What I'd like to do is to um, essentially, just making sure that I'm timing myself here, um, that I am giving a few introductory comments that then I know will lead a, uh, what I think uh, Professor Acharya would call a multipolar conversation uh, across the stage on the always fascinating and very relevant subject of China and its place in the world today. And what I'd like to do is to really just give four or five points and my point is not that these are the only four or five points that we have to think about, but rather these are four or five crucially important points that sit among a range of perhaps 10, 15, 20 crucially important points about the role of China in the world today. In other words, I think it is evident that whatever we think about, whether it is Norwegian foreign policy, whether it is British uh, domestic investment policy, whether it is the security stance of the United States, Today, there is no way to avoid making that in part a conversation about China. And that's why I think it is such a fabulous opportunity for us to have some time today to speak about that. I'd like to make my first point about what I think is most prominently on the minds of the Chinese leadership today. And I think that that is important because a great deal of what we will talk about is to do with foreign policy. But I will make my first point clear statement, very happy to have it uh, debated, argued, contradicted by our panel, is that right now, I think that the major focus in China is domestic. And I think it is about the economy. Because China reversed its COVID regulations so quickly, so unexpectedly, and I think most medical analysts would suggest actually under the spread of the Omicron variant, which clearly was spreading much faster in China than had been realized, because it happened so quickly and so completely, we sometimes forget that it was actually only four months ago that that took place, a very short time in the history of the global pandemic. The effects, though, of that particular set of uh, COVID-related uh, blows to the Chinese economy remain very significant. In areas such as retail, in areas such as the housing sector, there was a great deal of damage in terms of the growth in the Chinese economy. And the fact that this year the um, two meetings that's known, the, the National People's Congress and the related Consultative Congress, have put in an economic growth target of 
on uh, China's economy for the year is an indication in a sense of how far it had fallen, because 5% is a lot to grow any economy, particularly the second biggest economy in the world. But they will have calculated that that is plausible on the grounds of how far it had fallen. And I think if we look at the way in which one of the most um, uh, pressing issues in China at the moment is, uh, uh, is, is going, it shows, I think, the way in which China's leaders and the wider combination of the public and private sector, all of it overseen by the party, is thinking about these issues, is that the answer keeps coming back to technology. If you look at one of the most fervently discussed and debated areas at that party congress that I mentioned just a couple of weeks ago, it was actually the question of artificial intelligence and the way in which artificial intelligence could be used to rework the Chinese labor market. Again, the limits of time mean that I won't go into huge detail, but just to give one very particular example of how that was, that was brought about. One of the questions that has been very, very much at the heart of uh, China's discussion about domestic employment is, first of all, how you create more jobs for young people. Uh, graduate unemployment is now a major issue in China. And also how you spread the gender balance of employment, men and women both. And in this particular case, the argument is being used to some extent that technological change, the capacity to um, add value by working remotely and using various AI tools from home rather than necessarily uh, in a traditional office, a debate which is going on all around the world, is being given a particular spin in terms of making it potentially more friendly to women workers. This is not, I hasten to add, uh, a statement that this is necessary and necessarily an accurate analysis. I think there are quite a lot of flaws in that rather simplistic division. But that having been said, it's very important to note that these debates are now being had. And they're being had because I think one of the major crises that emerged publicly in China in the middle of last year during the pandemic period was the realization of how serious China's demographic crisis really is. You may remember the headline figures that came out a year ago with figures from China's own statistical authorities. But one extrapolation, just to illustrate the point, is that right now, uh, for every 100 working age Chinese, they are carrying the costs of 20 retirement age Chinese. If things continue in a straight line, they never do, particularly in China, but if they continued in a straight line to the end of this century, then you have a, something like a near reversal of that situation with something like um, over 100 retirement age Chinese having to operate off the back of a much smaller, perhaps 20 to 25, uh, of the working age Chinese who will be part of that much smaller working age population as a result of the inexorable squeezing that came from the famous one-child policy. The policy was ended seven or eight years ago, but the effects of the policy, of course, will remain for a very long time. This has also very, very significant effects in terms of short-term policy. China does not have a pensions system. It has many pension systems operating at the provincial level, some from private companies, others with, um, uh, uh, with uh, local state authorities. But all of those systems are underfunded and potentially liable to um, uh, go bankrupt if they don't raise the retirement ages. Our friend over in France, Mr. Macron, has in the last few days been having quite a few ups and downs, uh, ups as well as downs, on the question of pension ages. All I would say is that you might want to look to, to China to see how this works out in a society which also, as the COVID protest shows, does know sometimes how to make its views felt when it doesn't like a change in policy. You don't have to have elections to make your views felt. Healthcare will also be an area where I think that China, which has nothing like the healthcare system of Norway or even the United Kingdom, perhaps it's not quite what it was, but nonetheless, there is, uh, I assure you, still a healthcare system paid for by the state in the UK. In China, of course, there is not. Of course, there is a basic provision, but actually a lot of that, again, is to do with a particular type of social insurance and private provision. I think that that is one of the huge areas of concern for Chinese policymakers on everything from the cost and development of pharmaceuticals to the question of how you deal with the costs of elder care. Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, all sorts of other societies in East Asia have had to look at the way in which an older population is going to be looked after China is now facing that particular issue. And that, I think, gives context to the story that we hear more often on the domestic side, which is the rise of nationalist sentiment. And that is real. 
We've heard about the great rejuvenation of China. We've heard Xi Jinping's language in his recent speech where he talked about the need to uh, overcome the famous century of humiliation, the mid-19th to mid-20th century, when China was repeatedly invaded and occupied by foreign powers, by the British, by the French, by the, the Japanese. But that nationalism, it should be remembered, sits on top of this domestic situation where the crises are not fatal, in my opinion, they're not apocalyptic, but they are real, and they demand economic growth and stability as an absolute fundamental point for China to be able to reach that goal of moderate prosperity, Xiao Kang, to use the Chinese phrase, um, that the party wants to put forward. And I say that because it enables me then to pivot to trying to bring perspective to the question which is of most interest to this audience, which is China's foreign policy, and understanding that domestic situation as the background to how China thinks about these issues. So let me say a brief word, perhaps a minute or so on each, on three points which I think do um, speak to some of the major foreign policy directions and turns that China is undertaking now and will take for quite some years to come. The first is, in a sense, picking up on what Amitabhacharya said, which is the growth of Chinese influence in its own backyard, a very big backyard, the Asia-Pacific region. I'm not using the term Indo-Pacific here because India, I think, is in a different category. But in terms of Southeast Asia, the growth of ASEP, the growth of ASEAN, the growth of uh, APEC, a whole variety of organizations, almost all of them focused through economics, have become the framework through which a great deal of China's influence operates. And when that influence, a term which often is imbued with uh, a malign intent, but in this sense I'm using it very literally in terms of being able to operate through um, the, the tools of the economy, technology comes back again. Larger and larger numbers of countries in that growing region of economic region are using Chinese technology in 5G, they're using it uh, in terms of uh, artificial intelligence we've mentioned, in terms of fintech. In other words, the growth of Chinese norms in terms of technological and economic bases for the next phase of growth in the economy are becoming more and more notable. And I'd look, for instance, at the, the Bay Area project. In other words, the attempt to make the, I think at the moment possibly successful attempt, to make the Shenzhen tech hub in southern China and the Hong Kong market, uh, financial markets with deep pools of capital, a motor through which there will not only be the growth of South China as a major economic hub, Average per capita GDP for that part of China, not all of China, but that part of China is about 23,000 US dollars a year. It's not Norway, but it is Spain, it is Portugal. That's spreading out essentially within a two hour connectivity uh, connection to large parts of Southeast Asia, particularly with some of those light rail projects sponsored by the Belt and Road Initiative. That is part of the shape of what China intends for the next five, 10, 20 years and beyond. In doing that, they will have conversations with Europe. I ha I've deliberately haven't really mentioned the United States much. I think we will in the conversation. But I wanted to use this occasion to focus on the European side because I think there is still a hope in parts of Beijing that some aspects of European economic and political policy may make it more possible to separate off the European conversation, particularly if there is a president of the United States, not now, but in the mid-2020s, who is less amenable to conversation with Europe about common issues either in Europe or in the Asia-Pacific region beyond. And I think China is laying the ground at the moment to try and have those conversations uh, with a variety of actors who it feels are more sympathetic. The conversations with Germany in particular, I think, are important in that area. And let me um, also add that, of course, here in Norway, you'll be very aware, and I know that uh, Ren, who is here in the front, has written extensively on the question of Arctic policy and China's role as an observer at the Arctic Council. All I'll say on that is that policy writing in China on the question of how climate change and its effect on the Arctic region might change China's security and economic opportunities is certainly a small but very fast-growing area of interest and one of particular interest to Nordic nations. Let me end with the final thought, which is that overall, I can see a scenario, and I put it before you, in which there is an argument that China's continued steady economic growth post-COVID is likely to be the primary task of the, um, of the Chinese um, Communist Party and its leadership. But there is a game changer, and I would say that game changer is Taiwan. 
if the question of Taiwan goes in a direction where various sides are able to have some sort of dialogue with each other, and I'd note that former Taiwan leader Ma ying is now scheduled to go on a personal and private visit, as it's billed, to the Chinese mainland, but I think there's no doubt that that's being seen as a gesture that's trying to create some secondary channels of dialogue that currently don't exist between the island and the mainland. We'll, we'll see what comes of that. And those are important, I think. They need to be pursued, even if one has to acknowledge that both sides will have things to say, uh, including the Taiwan side, very, very strongly, I think. Because the question of a confrontation doesn't have to be a war. It could be something like a naval blockade in the Taiwan Straits could have a very, very damaging effect on everything from the stability and security of the Western Pacific to the security of shipping lanes and, of course, the question of everything from the supply of semiconductor chips from uh, Taiwan's uh, factories to the wider question of how other actors in the region, particularly Japan, choose to define their own security in terms of the relationship with the United States and their current competition with, uh, with China. Nothing has, as I mean, I've pointed out in a sense, nothing has yet happened on the question of Taiwan that is not reversible, but it does flag up the importance of making sure that there is calm and stability around the Taiwan issue as a game changer. Because with that, I would say, and this is my final thought on this, that almost all the other issues in the Asia-Pacific region can and should be discussed and negotiated to bring about a stable solution. But if things take off on the question of Taiwan, then the world, and I think it is the world, not just the Asia-Pacific region, could find itself in a very dangerous situation. And I'm sure that all here would want very actively to avoid that. So with those thoughts and comments, I hope we can move over to a panel discussion and look forward to picking up those and other points. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Rana, for that excellent introduction. Um, Really a crash course in both the domestic and foreign policy factors that China brings to us today. And I wanted to start by actually tying those two together. You know, you named as some of the domestic issues this post-COVID economic challenge China faces, the demographic crisis, which is, uh, of course, not just an issue that China faces, but also Japan South Korea, and even some countries uh, in Europe, Italy, for instance, Um, but also the fact that uh, China is grappling with a number of challenging foreign policy issue areas that relate back to these. So I'd like to go back to um, uh, Prime Minister Sturdes' point at the beginning of this session, right? The The goal of foreign policy is to make domestic politics possible. So in the context of China and some of the challenges that you discussed today, what is the focus for China's foreign policy in addressing these domestic challenges? It's a really good question, Ren. I would say that overall, I think the primary goal of China is to find a foreign policy that will enable it to stabilize not only the specific questions of economic growth and of uh, solving graduate unemployment that exist in China, but the wider goal of making sure that China's Communist Party is not challenged by any internal grouping whatsoever. We know that essentially the uh, already very limited space that existed for civil society and protest in the mainland of China, there was some limited space for that in in the early 2000s. That has almost all been eliminated in the last 10 years or so. It's very difficult to start up any kind of grassroots organization, even on issues that aren't necessarily dissident, uh, such as environmental concern. So there's a lot of top-down control of those areas. But I think the idea that has been put forward by China about what it sees the world changing into is one where individual rights are maybe not ignored, but they're certainly downplayed. But collective economic well-being and flourishing is regarded as a good in itself. Sometimes they even talk about that as being Mm. the first human right and obviously get plenty of pushback from uh, the liberal world. But they they have used the, the phrasing. So I think that idea of embedding China in an economic system where, let's be really frank, much of the rest of that world is much more dependent on China, for instance, on the maintenance of technological systems uh, and uh, uh, their, uh, their, their, their upgrading, but also 
from China's point of view, it's much better to have a stable global economic system from which China is able to grow its economy even further rather than a situation of conflict. I think it's still very unlikely, with Taiwan aside, we, we could talk about that, that China would find itself in the position of Russia of actually actively pushing an invasion or occupation of another country, breaking that territorial, uh, territorial sovereignty, because it doesn't suit the overall project. Mm. Thank you for that uh, response, and it's a good segue into my second question, which actually can t- deals with the issue of the war in, in Ukraine. And of course, China's position here is uh, crucial and much discussed, and we know that yesterday she and Uh, President Putin met in Moscow to discuss China's uh, peace plan for Moscow. Uh, An outcome of that we just learned is that uh, President Xi has now invited Putin also to come visit China. At the same time, uh, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has now made a surprise visit to Ukraine, one of the first Japanese leaders in the Second World War period to visit a war-struck country to show his unresolving and Japan's unresolving support for Ukraine. So we see a significant dynamic here on a geopolitical level I'm wondering if you could explain some of the positions of China when it comes to the war of Ukraine and what you see this summit meaning for the future planning. Mm. Absolutely. I think there are two or three strands coming together in what I think in Beijing is probably quite a, maybe not rapidly changing, but evolving attitude towards the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Ukraine crisis, broadly speaking. I would say that, first of all, I think that probably the expectation, as many others, was that the war would be over quite quickly last year. Mm. And so China essentially held back in commenting on it too much. But now that it's clear it's going to go on, at least in some form, for quite some time to come, I think China's trying to do two things. First of all, I think it is it has become quite keen on the idea of China as an international peacemaker. And this treaty signed, or rather the resumption of diplomatic relations that was uh, announced between Iran and Saudi Arabia a few weeks ago, which China had a significant role in, is being portrayed as China being on a roll in terms of being the peacemaker that can go and talk to people who the United States mm. cannot. Now, the problem is that Ukraine is going to be much more intractable than uh, the, this particular Middle Eastern uh, question. And And because there is a phone call supposedly set up but not yet actually scheduled or held between President Zelensky and uh, uh, Xi Jinping, it remains to be seen whether or not China can actually address the core issue for the Ukrainians, which is the violation of their sovereignty. China has acknowledged that that, uh, that Ukraine has sovereignty, but they haven't talked about how to square the circle with Putin at all. But they might argue by having made Putin as comfortable as he clearly is with Xi Jinping. And you've seen their body language. I mean, you know, Ren and I look quite comfortable here, but Xi and Putin are basically, you know, sitting there kind of chewing the, uh, chewing the fat. Um, that someone like that is in a better position to talk privately to Vladimir Putin and say, you know, you have to do this, you have to do that, or at least has a chance of, uh, of, of doing so. But in a sense, it's no lose for China, because if they don't manage to negotiate a peace, well, as China itself keeps saying, nobody really expected that China was going to be the deal maker or the deal breaker. And if they do manage to come up with something, then their image as a country in the world that can get things done will be even stronger. So she is probably in quite a, a helpful position from, from his point of view. Interesting, and will be very telling to see what happens now with the, the next summit in, in China. Um, I'd like to shift gears a bit, still on the foreign policy uh, aspect, but uh, this year marks 10 years since China became an observer of the Arctic Council. It also marks 10 years since uh, President Xi uh, announced the Belt Road Initiative. And this is a colossal undertaking, of course, a global infrastructure project, and this project has also incited a number of alternatives from other Western powers, namely the US, EU, the G7, Mm -hmm. Japan. And we're at this point now, 10 years on, trying to evaluate what are some of the failures or what are some of the successes of Mm -hmm. the BRI and how we can really assess how these other alternatives provide Mm -hmm. responses or different options for for many countries, but I'd say in particular for the countries in Southeast Asia, as Archaya has Mm -hmm. mentioned today, which have really been the hub and heart of both the Belt Road Initiative, but also Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific and other policies. How do you evaluate Mm -hmm. the BRI and where do you see it going in the coming years? Do you see it fading in the background or do you see it coming back in full force? So there's BRI 1.0 and there's BRI version 2. The 1.0, the one that's existed for the last decade or so, 
I think actually essentially has a record card which has some successes and some failures. So on the success side, I mean, it depends how you define it, but broadly speaking, if you look at, say, the infrastructure that was built in Ethiopia, a country which has registered until its tragic civil war, and to be fair, I think um, many things one can blame China for and people do, but the civil war in Ethiopia is not, I think, directly one of them. But up to that point, um, it was showing 11% growth rate, and it was a country that had had um, significant infrastructural investment from China in areas like high-speed freight rail, for instance, as well as port and shipping facilities. So Ethiopia perhaps could be counted on the plus side. On the downside in that part of the world, you have the Kenya-Uganda high-speed railway, which essentially mm. has been abandoned halfway through. Closer to home here in Europe, the Montenegro highway has not been, I think, considered a great success. And one of the reasons is that some of those projects that China put money into were actually not invested in by others because they weren't in the end uh, feasible in terms of a return to the, uh, uh, to the investors. And that, I think, is the reason for the turn that I mentioned from version one to version two, because essentially that first version of BRI was large, pretty opaque, non-transparent loans given by Chinese development banks to uh, institutions in countries or entities in countries to build particular pieces of infrastructure. Many of them, by the way, have 15-year maturities, so we'll know in many cases fairly mm. soon how mm. the scorecard came out. But basically, at the um, online for the um, China-Africa Friendship Conference in uh, autumn 2020, or December, I think, actually, 2021, um, held in Dakar, Senegal, um, Xi Jinping made it clear, using slightly more polite language, that the era of big Chinese loans with a very long return or no return at all was over, and that instead, China is now moving much more to encouraging the private sector, which of course is under the aegis of the party, there's no doubt about that whatsoever, but unlike those development loans, has actually much short-term shareholder returns that are being demanded. And in that area, it's basically being turned towards some very focused areas, uh, the development of green energy in particular, um, the rolling out of 5G and um, high quality um, uh, telecom systems. Argentina would be a good example of that quite recently. Mm -hmm. And the third, which is slightly in abeyance, may come back, is what's called the Health Silk Road, which was first about COVID vaccines, but now is perhaps more about pharmaceuticals more generally. Looking at that private sector driven, focused BRI is, I think, where the next decade or so is going to go. Exciting to follow. Thank you so much, Rana, for your comments. And I would like to now uh, invite our other panel participants to the stage, uh, Laria Karotza and Yoinga Beckefold, for their comments. Um, we will start with Ilaria, who is a senior researcher at PRIO, the Peace Research Institute of Oslo. Ilaria's research focuses on Chinese foreign and security policy, digital technology and artificial intelligence, China-Africa relations, and China-U.S. relations, among a number of other related topics. We're very lucky to have you here today. Ilaria, the floor is yours. Cheers, Ren, and thank you so much, Rana, for your introductory comments on this huge topic. I would like to pick up on a few things that you mentioned and others mentioned uh, in, in previous panels, too. Um, so looking at the domestic situation in China, I mean, you talked a little bit about uh, the ideological part of it. Um, so I think it's clear now that the window of opportunity that um, we saw in the 1980s for more liberal and free market-oriented policies closed when Deng Xiaoping's faction won. Um, and so that time is gone. <laughs> the future course is pretty much set. Uh, I think the 20th Party Congress in October and now the two sessions um, that just concluded uh, are telling us that this is the beginning of a much more not only party-based but also individual-based and ideological-based politics, right? Um, and the reshuffling of government positions, several ministries that we've seen now that marks yet another step in taking more powers from the state, which already, to be honest, had pretty much symbolic uh, functions, but uh, to give them to the party. Uh, and so now the real decisions, there is no doubt they're taken by the party, the state is implementing those. Um, so how does that translate then into foreign policy? Um, I think it translates into a China that uh, is trying to change the current world order. And it does so uh, by some legitimate means, but it also does so by bullying other countries, by coercing other countries through uh, economic means, military means, security, uh, rhetoric, diplomatic. I mean, Norway would know about the diplomatic uh, coercion, uh, but there's also other kinds of tactics, right? There's cyber attacks, there's arbitrary detentions, there's sanctions on individuals. These are all tactics that have been used um, you know, against Taiwan, first and foremost, but also a number of European countries um, lately. Um, and then 
sort of staying on the foreign policy uh, side of things, I wanted to focus on, uh, so you touched a little bit about the, on the um, Asia Pacific, and I also wanted to discuss the Global South, which was uh, again discussed earlier. So when it comes to the Asia Pacific or the Indo-Pacific broadly, that is clearly the region where China's aggressiveness, um, especially in the military and security sphere, has created more anxiety and more alarmed. Alarm. So I've recently returned um, uh, um, from a trip to Taipei and Tokyo with a colleague, uh, and we talked uh, with uh, people from government, uh, party members, defense officials, and fellow academics. Uh, and it's clear that there is a consensus forming among like-minded countries, and, and by that I mean Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea chiefly, um, uh, to, to sort of uh, that China represents a threat, and that there needs that, they, that something needs to be done also in the security and military sphere about that. And Taiwan, in particular, from our conversations, emerges is working really hard to really create this kind of triangle with, again, Japan and South Korea to strengthen their position um, and creating some kind of front uh, to, to, to face China. I mean, in Japan, they just increased their uh, national defense budget. In Taiwan, they extended uh, compulsory military service from four months to, uh, to one year. And those were moves that were actually really popular among the people in countries that are normally very pacifist, right? Um, uh, so and we also asked, uh, because you talked about uh, the Ukraine war and China's position and that, we also asked uh, especially uh, Taiwanese people about the war in Ukraine because it's often the case that you hear, you know, Ukraine today, Taiwan tomorrow, right? So it was kind of an obvious question to, um, uh, to pose. And, and certainly, I mean, people in Taiwan have been living under the threat of invasion and war for decades, and so this is nothing new for them. But what we were told is that, of course, now they, they, they kind of become more aware of it. You know, they're like, oh, suddenly this can happen to us as well. It's not just this faraway threat that maybe will materialize, maybe not. Um, and so, uh, of course, the situation in Taiwan is very different from Ukraine for a number of reasons. Um, uh, but, but certainly people in East Asia are watching, you know, the, uh, how the war is going very closely. Uh, and probably Xi Jinping is learning some lessons too, uh, perhaps about how the West really came together uh, to support the Ukrainian cause. Uh, and this leads me to the last point that I wanted to make about the Global South, because it is true what Acharya said, the Global South is not one thing. Um, unlike the West, in the case of the Ukraine war, uh, the Global South has emerged as much more divided. Mm. What I mean is that um, there were about 141 countries that supported a United Nations uh, measure demanding uh, a Russian unconditional withdrawal from Ukraine, but there were also 47 countries from the Global South that abstained or missed the vote. Um, and those have been providing some kind of diplomatic or rhetorical support to Russia, right, in the, uh, in the past year. And even some of the nations that has, uh, had initially agreed to denounce Russia now see the war mostly as somebody else's problem. Um, uh, and they've sort of since shifted towards more neutral position. Brazil, Turkey, UAE is just uh, a few among those. Um, and, and again, most of these countries, they really view uh, Ukraine's war and Russia's invasion as primarily a European and an American problem. Like, it's none of our business. We have more serious domestic issues to take care of. Um, and then the reason why I'm mentioning this is because I think we ought in no way in Europe to pay more attention to what these countries' positions are, right? These, China has, and Russia to an extent, but particularly China has been really successful in these countries. You know, it's soft power, really. I think we've, we've seen, the, in a way, the best of it, particularly in Africa, but also increasing in Latin America, the Middle East, as you mentioned, and also in, in Southeast Asia and Central and South Asia except perhaps India. Um, and so I really think we ought to watch that space, especially when it comes to uh, the contest for what kind of world order we're going into. Mm. Thanks. Thank you, Laria, for those contributions. Rana, do you have any immediate reactions before we move on to Yoinga? Just one very quick one. I mean, I, I think I you know, agreed absolutely with everything you've said there. One point about, you know, even... East Asia, is that it does sound like what you're describing, and drawing on again from what Amitabh was saying earlier, that there might be a bit of a divide emerging between Northeast Asia mm. and Southeast Asia. The countries you mentioned, of course, are all East Asian allies, like-minded liberal democracies, mm -hmm. but they all sit much closer to China. Mm -hmm. And when you talk to the Indonesia-Malaysia um, nexus, so to speak, in Southeast Asia, or to ASEAN, it's not that they're clearly in China's pocket, and many of those countries have a strong reason not to be too close to China, particularly on security areas, mm -hmm. to do with the South 
South China Sea. But it's very clear that they are not necessarily sold on the idea that China has to be seen first and foremost as a threat. Mm -hmm. And the position of Singapore, actually, amongst other things, remains very interesting on that, since Singapore is masterly as a very small country in actually being something of a swing voter in mm. terms of some of those issues. Mm. So I would divide the region even further Absolutely. in that context. Mm. Great, thank you. Next, I would like to turn to Joinge Beckerwald, who is a senior advisor at the Institute of Defense Studies here in Oslo. Joinge's research focuses on great power relations in Asia, Chinese geopolitics, China-India relations, sea power, grand strategy, and strategic thinking, and that's just to name a few things. <laughs> Going the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Ren. Uh, it's uh, a great honor to, to be here. Uh, I'll make five points, so that means one minute each point. It means I will <laughs> speak in, in headlines, but I'm happy to elaborate a little bit uh, later on. Um, my first concerns sort of where are we? Uh, early this morning it was asked whether we are whether the best reference is 1914 or 1939. Uh, I make another suggestion. Uh, I think we are... Uh, history never repeats itself, but, but history is useful to, to make comparisons, to see similarities and differences. Mm -hmm. And I think the best reference to understand where we are now is 1951. Mm -hmm. And by saying 1951, I mean that we are one year into the war in Ukraine, and in 1951, the world was one year into the war in Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, so we should think about the war in Ukraine as, as something similar as, as the war in Korea. The Korean War from 1950 to 53 consolidated the, the Cold War as a global phenomenon with two great powers in a very intense rivalry. And this is where we are at today not between the US and Russia, but between the US and China. So China has been growing. We are in. The US and China are the main things these two countries are thinking about is the rivalry with, with their counterpart. And this domin dominates their, their foreign policy uh, thinking. And in such a world order with, with two great powers, a bipolar order, anything these two countries are doing uh, cuts across, it influences the military, security, economics, research, cooperation, it's all encompassing. So I think, that for me, that's, that's the best uh, reference. Mm -hmm. um, my second point uh, concerns uh, how this informs Norway's foreign policy. Mm -hmm. Because I think, for Norway, the three main sort of issues forming Norway's foreign policy, it's the United Nations, it's who's our main security guarantor, the United States, and it's our main security challenge, which, which is Russia. So when you have two great powers in a rivalry, that means less room for maneuver, less room for the United States, and less room for maneuver for Norway. Uh, so the United States will be less influential, and which is, for Norway, we like to look upon the United Nations as kind of our first line of defense, and this will be more challenging for, for Norway going, going forward. And when it comes to the United States, they are focused elsewhere. The U.S. will never leave Europe. Europe is too important for the United States. But the United States in the future will give less priority to Europe. Not leave, but less priority. Last October, the Biden administration came out with the first national security strategy. And they clearly said security challenge number one for the United States is China, and number two is Russia. And they issued that security paper while there is a war going on in Europe. Mm -hmm. So the US will pivot more to, to Asia. Russia, our main security challenge, mm -hmm. they are supported by the other great power, China. So th this is a new reality. And again, th these are the headlines, but this is the reality uh, that uh, above all will, will inform Norway's uh, foreign policy. My third point is on China-Russia. Xi Jinping is currently in Moscow. And I think it's very important to understand that the main driver of this relationship is geopolitics. Mm -hmm. It's not Xi Jinping and Putin being best friends. It's not about identity. It's, it's not about economic relations. It's all about geopolitics. Both China and Russia see the importance of working together by having a close, cordial relationship, these two countries both can have the strategic rear to each other safe. China can focus 
on standing up to the United States in the naval rivalry in East Asia, and Russia can channel its resources standing up to NATO in, in Europe. So it's geopolitics, and this makes it more... So the foundation is stronger. If, it, it, if the re- relationship was only based on Xi and Putin being best friends, it would be less uh, stable. With geopolitics uh, as the basics of this uh, relationship, it means it's, it's actually more and more stable for these two countries. But also I totally agree with what even Neumann said this morning. Russia is becoming the junior partner. So the main question actually when we come out of the war in Ukraine is, How weakened and how dependent will Russia be on China? Mm. Uh, My next uh, main point concerns China's peace proposal on Ukraine. Mm. It was not a peace plan. It was not detailed enough to be that, but it was a peace proposition. I would like to make three points concerning the the, the peace plan, because I think this is best viewed not as Mm. a peace plan per se for Ukraine, but this again is is best viewed as, as, as one piece in the, in the larger uh, quest between the U.S. and, and China for, for global leadership. So by forwarding this peace uh, proposition, China, I totally agree with, with what, what Rana said, that this is a mes- message to the wider world that China tries to position itself as, as a, a peacemaking country, and they are actually contributing in, in some respect to that. We, we should not, not totally neglect that. China is actually doing, doing some, some important work in terms of, of, of peace. But this is, this is one message. And we should also look at the, the peace proposition as China's atta- attempt to reset its relationship with Europe. Because Beijing knows that China's support to Russia during uh, the last year has harmed China's relationship with Europe. So this is an effort to reset its relationship with Europe. And thirdly, the peace proposition, the last point in the peace proposition clearly states that China wants a position in reconstructing Ukraine. I think that that is also very important. My last point, fifth and last point, is actually one of the things that in particular the United States is looking at is whether China will start supporting Russia with arms. And then I'm not talking about perhaps some that you will find some parts, Chinese parts in drones, or that China may may uh, share some satellite images and intelligence with with uh, with Russia. I'm talking about substantial arms support. If that happens, it will be a game changer. Mm-hmm. And that goes back also to to Rana's point, because your point was that. China's number one priority is the economy. And if that's the case, it wouldn't make sense for China to start supporting Russia with arms. If it does, it will be a game changer. It means that the United States and Europe will have to respond with sanctions. And then we are looking at the world economy, which will be extremely different from the one we have experienced over the last three decades. Thank you. Thank you, Jovinga, for your comments. Uh, Rana, it sounds like you actually have a lot of uh, uh, coinciding points, but if you have any immediate comments before we break into one, the broader panel's discussion. One, one very brief one. And again, Jovinga made you know, fantastic points, and I think I've been agreeing with pretty much every, every, every one of them. Um, I do think, by the way, that the personal relationship with Xi and Putin is not by any means the most important thing. As you say, it is about the geopolitics. But I think it helps that they get on. One of the issues with Hu Jintao was that he found it very mm. difficult, from all we can see, to really have that kind mm. of engagement with other leaders. And he and Yeltsin and others you know, clearly were not you know, very very sympathetic. And back in the days of the 1950s and 60s, the personal breakdown between Mao and Khrushchev was tremendously important. And it matters more, I think, in autocratic societies where there are very few other areas of, of, of influence. But just one other point. There was one other person, of course, who, who is not. They're still in Moscow, of course, chatting with each other uh, today, and they will be till tomorrow. But there's one person who isn't there, but I suspect it's at the back of the minds of both Putin and um, Xi, and that's Narendra Modi. Mm. Because, of course, the relationship of India mm. to both of them, while not crucial and transformative, is important. China, of course, has a border dispute with India. Uh, China doesn't like the fact that India has joined the Quad, although it is perhaps the most uh, ambivalent member of the of the Quad grouping. On the other hand, China, India is the other major customer for all of those fossil fuels from mm-hmm. Russia, along with uh, China. 
And it is, of course, also the country that continues to get nearly 50% of its armaments from Russia as well, including the servicing and the upkeep and so forth as well. So I often find myself asking on rare occasions when I meet you know, diplomats from these different countries, when Chinese and Russians are talking to each other about the Indians, what do they say? And then change the other two, depending who you want in the triangle. But I think that the, the, the spirit, as it were, of Narendra Modi at the back of the room may be something that's also there in terms of the way in which they're trying to lay out lines that they're willing to do for each other. Mm. That's an interesting point, and always uh, important to bring in the, the India aspect. Modi, uh, as many may know, was uh, actually in a meeting with the Japanese prime minister the past two days. Mm. So again, Indeed. it seems the different uh, individuals are, are moving in strategic moves. Um, I'd like to focus a bit on the role of technology now, and in particular, what are the consequences of some recent technological developments for Europe and Norway's relations with China? And this actually piggybacks on a question that came from the audience. Uh, Western countries such as the U.S. are trying to block China's rise, especially in technology and other areas. Will that slow China's rise or reduce China's existing power? How will this affect relations when it comes to technology with European countries and with Norway? Is that too... Anyone? You can start and we can... Please, Roma. Mm. Okay, yep, sure. Please. Um, I think that most analysts of the U.S. CHIPS Act would suggest that, at least as put forward, it has provided a significant constraint on China's ability to innovate in a whole variety of areas, mm. particularly relating to domestically produced um, semiconductors. And it's certainly been read by the Chinese in that way. And um, when I talked um, early, earlier about that, actually very extensive and actually quite well-recorded conversation about artificial intelligence that was a big subject of debate at the, the, the two meetings just a couple of weeks ago in, in, in Beijing, that was the backdrop to it, the need to indigenize technology more on the, mm. on the, Chinese, uh, the Chinese side. So you can read it in both directions. One is that the CHIPS Act and things related to it, including, of course, now the Netherlands being pressured not to provide lithographic equipment um, to, to the Chinese um, and an attempt to uh, recreate the TSMC uh, factories in Arizona are all part, of course, of a name of cutting China off from certain technologies, but they're also, of course, pushing China further in the direction mm. of producing it indigenously. And in a sense, it's a bet on how much can be done in the extraordinarily large and innovative number of technology hubs within China itself, in Shenzhen, in Hangzhou, up in Haidian, um, in the northwest of, uh, of, uh, of Beijing. I think as long as things continue without the kind of conflagration or confrontation that we mentioned in, uh, uh, around Taiwan or anything else, it's probably fair to say that both sides, in a sense, will continue to indigenize their technological production more because they're starting from already very well-equipped bases. Mm. But I think that the level of global development of these technologies will probably overall be slower than it would have done had there been continued to be interaction and cooperation. Because one last fact on this, if you look at the number of Country, a number of papers on artificial intelligence, for instance, mm -hmm. um, which are done between researchers from two different countries. The United States and China is still way ahead in terms of the list. And I think that kind of cooperation, mm -hmm. when it stops or re reduces, inevitably means that both sides lose some of their knowledge base. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Rana. Laria? Yeah, yeah, just following up. I mean, so, so one thing is obviously China's, uh, the potential and challenges within China's domestic uh, artificial intelligence and technology development more broadly. Uh, and I think, again, it's pretty clear that Xi Jinping has put science and technology uh, front and center in the development of the country in uh, realizing, you know, the Chinese dream and national rejuvenation. And actually the recent reshuffling of the Ministry of Science and Technology shows exactly that, you know, he's trying to really um, simplify the bureaucracy within the ministry so that it's going to be easier for them to, again, execute directives from the party, which is to make China self, technologically self-reliant. So that's one aspect. Um, the second aspect, which you already touched upon, is to the extent to which um, uh, the external constraints that are put by the U.S. as its allies are going to work to constrain China's development. And I mean, if they are to work, then the U.S. cannot act alone. I think that has been pretty, pretty clear. And, you know, it needs allies, and it needs allies to be on its side. Um, a third point that I wanted to, uh, to mention, speaking again of countries receiving Chinese technology, because um, I have a project uh, ongoing on that exactly with a focus on Southeast Asia. And I mean, I think we tend to forget how those countries, they want Chinese technology. It's not like China is going and, you know, just exporting their technology, whatever they want, because they want to do it. Like they are mostly uh, demanded 
driven, right? The, 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 these, you know, I'm focusing on Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia. Those countries really want Chinese technology. But importantly, they don't just want Chinese technology. They're also importing technology from the US, they're importing technology from some European countries. So, you know, we're not really in a kind of block situation where they either get technology from one or the other. And also, importantly, uh, when they're importing technology, they're importing also norms, they're importing rules, they're importing practices, but they're also making their own. I mean, these countries have their own agencies, they have their own regulators, they have their own ways of dealing with technology. So I think the picture there when it comes to the technological battle, so to speak, is really much more nuanced than what it seems. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Excellent. Yoinga. Yeah, on technology, I mean... <laughs> This is one of the sectors where we see decoupling already taking place, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the US is ahead of China. Uh, so that means that China has more to lose uh, decoupling. But having said that, I think China has been aware of this possibility for a number of years. So mm -hmm. China has really put a lot of resources and money into building very competent research environments in China on new technologies. So if we look at the sort of number of companies, private companies, state-supported uh, companies, state of the companies doing research, for instance, on artificial intelligence, U.S. companies are mainly leading, but Chinese companies are doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. Could I just one note on the Nordic question, actually? I don't know if Yonya wants to come back. Uh, and I'm going to say something possibly naive here in front of this audience. It seems to me that um, two of your neighbours in the shape of Sweden, which is home to Ericsson, and um, Finland in the shape of Nokia, have particular debates and issues around proprietary technology to do with 5G and beyond that maybe are not as central to Norway's proposition. But am I wrong in thinking that? Yuinga, do you have uh, an immediate response? The, so your, your question is whether Norway is sort of <clears throat> not in the forefront on, on new technologies? The, qu the question is basically countries which, I mean, in a reverse of the Huawei question, uh, where essentially the use of Huawei is now going to be very restricted in large numbers of global mm -hmm. north markets. Um, there are only a very small number of companies around the world that have that kind of 5G production capacity, Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung, maybe. 5, and two of them, 5G, yeah. Yeah, and, and two of those happen to be uh, countries in uh, Scandinavia or, or, or Finland. Is, is, is uh, therefore the question of how the U.S., would regard the sale of that technology, the development of it, is going to be clearly a geopolitical question around technology in the next few years. My sense is that that technological question and the direct question of technology exports and collaboration with China is maybe less immediately urgent in Norway than it might be in those markets. But am I, am I wrong to think that? Well, Huawei and uh, <clears throat> cooperation with, uh, with all the Nordic countries was a huge topic two, three years ago. Mm. So uh, all the Nordic countries are leaning with the United States mainly on, on, on that issue. Mm. So I think if we foresee a decoupling, uh, all the Nordic countries, all NATO members will clearly go with the United States on, on that issue. Mm. I see that the clock is ticking, so I'd like to turn to our last um topic of discussion here, and that's about possibilities moving forward for Europe, but especially for Norway, considering the many points that we've discussed today on domestic factors, also the foreign policy issues at the forefront of China's agenda. Where should Norway uh, place its interests? What should be the priorities that we focus on in the coming years when it comes to engaging China? And perhaps, Yuinga, we can start again with you. Yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, I think in my sort of opening remarks, I, I um, said that we are, we are moving towards a world that is more polarized. I don't think we will ever reach a level of polarization that we had during the Cold War, because the point of departure is so diff different. Uh, but we are moving into a world economy you know, uh, that is more polarized than what we have witnessed the last three decades. And so when you have two great powers in a rivalry, it means that secondary states are more sort of compelled to choose side. Mm -hmm. These are the sort of the gravity of bipolarity points in this direction, right? So it means that it will be more difficult for Norway to keep its relationship with China the same way as we had over the last three decades. Mm -hmm. But again, I think we should we should not shut the door completely. And I think uh, 
it's important also, as, as the, the Norwegian Prime Minister said, said this morning, it, it's still of vital importance to work with China to solve a number of global issues, mm -hmm. but it will become more complicated uh, move, moving forward, certainly. Thank you. Alania? Yeah, I think um, I agree with what you just said. I'll just add that I think China will continue to divide and co or to try to divide and conquer Europe. Uh, and from where I stand, tensions with the U.S. are only going to get worse, at least in the short to medium term. And so I think Europe, um, in this sort of finding itself increasingly squeezed between you know China and the U.S.'s interests, um, I think it's really it's of paramount importance that it uh, has its own independence policy, independent policy on China. Uh, like it, um, uh, you know, it can't keep relying just on the U.S. And I mean, the next president might be uh, a much more isolationist and volatile president than than, than Biden. Uh, and so, while it is great, obviously, if uh, Europe, uh, U.S. relations stay a good course, I think um, uh, we need to develop our own independent thinking. I mean, we talk about uh, knowledge of Russia. I mean, the same goes for China. We need knowledge of China. I mean, China is also. It's not the black box, the monolithic black box, black box that we think it is. It's changing. It's very dynamic. We really need to be on top of that um, to address the challenges that it poses. Absolutely. Rana, your closing comment? A brief uh, thought. Um, I think that the, for, for countries in Europe in particular, there is the opportunity. It's probably quite a narrow window, but it's a, it's a real one of trying to open up that conversation with other global actors mm. to work out a way in which there can be a shared conversation about the place that China is going to have in the world. I think the danger we sometimes have is that we assume that we can say things or do things to China. We will act with China on this, mm. we won't act with China on that. China is the second biggest economy in the world, it's the second biggest military in the world. It has quite a lot of ideas of its own about what it wants to do. And the question about how you actually try and refashion that conversation in directions that China finally recognizes that not everything that maximizes China's interest is necessarily in the world's interest. And that's a difficult conversation to have a, with a country that is you know, relatively closed in terms of its discourse and which has only come up in the world in the last 20 or 30 years. That can be done, but it cannot be done only by the United States and the global north. And therefore, countries that, you know, like Norway, I think like the UK and, mm -hmm. and others, that can have that conversation with the wider world and then bring that dialogue to China. But not what China and the world often have, which is two monologues going past each other, mm -hmm. but a genuine discussion of the difficult areas. It's a very, very difficult task, but I can't think in the world at the moment of a more important geopolitical task to undertake. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rana. Sounds like the consensus is to keep the door open, but to take well-thought-out footsteps and looking towards areas of cooperation and avoiding conflict in the coming years. Uh, with that, I would like to close this panel. I would like to also first mention to the audience that we will be taking a short break and start up at 1.55 p.m. Thank you again to the session panelists, and uh, we look forward to seeing you back here shortly.